Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Caleb. I'm the founder of Savant Solutions. We're a cybersecurity company headquartered up in Sacramento. Uh, we do a lot of work currently with uh, the MESAC community, uh, a ton of the lo local cities. Uh, really support all your efforts and everything. Uh, today, we actually uh, have a partnership we're going to talk about with, uh, with a company called Arctic Wolf. They're going to give you a managed SOC solution. Um, but with that, I'm going to have uh, James kind of kick it off and talk about his uh, stories from here. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Caleb. Uh, so, so like I said, uh, with Arctic Wolf Networks, I'm James McCarthy. I'm a senior systems engineer uh, kind of out in the field. I'm actually based in San Francisco. Uh, I kind of cover California and the Rockies and all that. Um, our hope today was to, to go over a little bit of a, a kind of a cautionary tale, if you will. Uh, I think this is kind of some of the war stories that we found uh, through, through the active business, uh, you know, taking on customers and, and generally being a security operations center for these people. Uh, you see a lot of interesting things. Uh, some of the things you see out of the gate day one, uh, you know, wildly misconfigured networks that have, you know, huge security holes. Uh, and some of it's just things that have come up kind of in the, in the course of time uh, that we've discovered and issues that we found on customers' networks. Um, you know, all, all of this is, is kind of been redacted from the sense that there's no specific customers talked about. Uh, we have one uh, that they actually gave us permission to, to kind of talk through um, it, it, so that we could use them as kind of a, a cautionary tale as well. Uh, they're a company that you would be familiar with if you're based here in California, uh, a company called Hornblower. They do uh, cruises and cruise lines and stuff for, for like dinner cruises and what have you. Um, they had an interesting incident that I can kind of go over and talk to you guys about. But um, the idea again is just to kind of go over some of these interesting things that we found. Uh, some of the, the interesting stories. Uh, and then honestly, if you guys have any questions or anything else too about you know, cybersecurity, specifically around uh, security operations centers uh, and delivering it as a service, definitely ask those questions as we go. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about, insider threat, right? We know that insider threat's obviously a pretty big, uh, a, a pretty large threat vector, uh, if you will. Uh, and it's definitely one that's not lost on us, right? We see a lot of issues pop up from users on the network, uh, whether they intend to or not. Sometimes it's on accident, sometimes it's intentional. Um, the idea is, uh, in, this can, in this case, in this scenario here, what we actually did is we discovered uh, some ransomware that was on a network, right? Uh, we saw something that was phoning home to a, a command and control server. This ransomware that we detected looked like a specific version that was unique to Windows. So we thought, okay, this is a Windows variant of you know, ransomware X, Y, and Z, that's fine. Uh, but for whatever reason, the, the engineer on our team, when we started to do the actual detection, we realized that it's not coming from a Windows machine, it's actually coming from a Linux machine. So why is there a, a Windows-only variant of ransomware being reported on a Linux machine that shouldn't be able to run that, right? Uh, so we dug a little deeper and thought, okay, this is interesting. Something's going on here on this network. Uh, we escalated the incident to the customer, uh, you know, did some more forensics. As we're going through that process, we started to realize that what was happening was they had an employee on staff at a remote location that was actually building out his own custom ransomware something he wanted to leverage the company's network to try and you know, spread or to try and leverage some of the CPU resources. Uh, so he was using Kali Linux, which is a pretty you know, standard popular version of, of uh, distribution of Linux used for uh, kind of more ethical or white hat hacking, but can also be used for uh, other things, you know, more nefarious. Uh, so when we realized what was happening, right, we, we've got an employee at a customer that's now intentionally trying to create ransomware and leverage the customer's, uh, you know, business network to do that. Uh, obviously, the escalation route stopped going to the engineer uh, and started going to uh, management and started going into the, the more director level. Uh, so we were able to not only detect the initial threat of, you know, hey, this is happening on the network, but then we were able to, you know, kind of understand because we're delivering the actual SOC service and not just throwing alerts over a fence, we realize, hey, there's context here that we probably shouldn't just escalate to this guy's peers. We should probably go a little higher, right? Because this, this is a real threat that they might need to actually engage, you know, uh, authorities or something similar uh, in this scenario. So um, the idea, again, behind that is, is sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not intentional. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about here is a similar story where... Um, this person wasn't necessarily trying to, you know, a hack or attack other people from the corporate network. He was just trying to take advantage of unused CPU cycles on the business network as well as their electricity bill, right? Uh, so we, what happened is, is kind of initially we said, okay, we saw a, a machine on the network trying to farm uh, Bitcoin. We saw communication out to a Bitcoin server. Uh, it's very easy to, to, to kind of tell what that traffic is. We said, okay, somebody on the network is mining Bitcoin. Great. Uh, we have a little image here, spent 400K on equipment, mined 0.6 Bitcoins. That's, that's, about, that's about right. Uh, so we noticed the, the traffic, like I said, going to this 
this Bitcoin server, uh, and we thought to ourselves, okay, you know, this is probably an unintended, you know, a uh, piece of malware that's on a network that's trying to leverage uh, a business network's, you know, uh, resources to, to mine Bitcoin for an attacker. Uh, what we realized, though, is after we started talking and started doing more research, we realized this was somebody who was doing it intentionally on the network. They're using credentials that were that were authenticated. We didn't see any other indicators of compromise that might say, hey, this is a hacker that's external to the organization. Uh, so what we did is we escalated again uh, out to the, the actual leadership of the organization, which was a lesson that we learned from that first time uh, when we detected an insider threat. Um, it's not always good to, to escalate to engineering resources if we see a potential engineering resource that's compromised. Uh, sometimes leadership needs to be involved because they can make better decisions for the business. Um, so again, escalated to the customer and the leadership team, uh, and the, the employee was terminated uh, because they had been doing it apparently for a very, very long time. Uh, and there's a lot of real costs, not only real costs with, you know, literal power usage and, and CPU usage for the customer, uh, but also potential uh, issues in terms of, of how that looks, right? If you've got an employee using a company's network to, to mine Bitcoin and something happens, that's, that's a threat vector, right? That's a potential risk that a customer or a company doesn't want to take on, uh, especially if they're not getting any benefit for it, right? The, the employee got uh, a Bitcoin and called it a day. So, yeah, interesting things, you know, we can see, uh, you know, employees on the network constantly trying to, you know, use unused resources, unused servers to do things like building out malware, like mining Bitcoin. Uh, we see pretty commonly customers that have uh, engineers, you know, kind of running their own like homebrew software on the network. Um, we, we like homebrew stuff. I have a huge homebrew network at home that I use, but uh, that's not on a business network. And that's an extremely important detail. Uh, so we escalate that kind of information to customers from time to time. It's not super common, but it does happen. Uh, and it's good for the, the leadership to be aware that these things are happening. Uh, it's not like we're trying to go out there and, and, and upset engineers and, and get them fired. Uh, but if they're doing something that can cause a risk to the organization, the organization needs to know, uh, even if it's unintended. Great, great question. So, so this one with the Kali Linux, their, their job was actually security analyst. Uh, so we had somebody whose whose job it was, and I think part of it was that they might not have been happy that Arctic Wolf kind of came in and took over some of their functionality. Um, we actually never really displace security engineering talent that customers already have. Uh, but in this case, this is somebody who was like, all right, I'm gonna take it in my own hands. Um, the organization, I think this one, they were about 1,200 employees, so they had a small security team. They had three guys that were kind of dedicated to security. Um, but they didn't have a 24-7 SOC or anything, so they didn't really do full monitoring. Uh, and this had been happening for a while, so the customer didn't catch it. Uh, they had Splunk in, uh, installed at the time, but they weren't, uh, which is kind of the traditional experience with Splunk, is they spend all the money, they got it in place, they used professional services to get it set up and running, then a year later, nothing was configured and, and they, didn't, you know, they weren't watching for that kind of traffic. So, uh, and plus, the guy who was supposed to be watching for the traffic was the one causing the traffic. So it gets a little bit tricky when you've got, you know, kind of the, the, the fox guarding the hen house, if you will. Um, so, so that's kind of what that scenario was. Uh, they were a government entity on the East Coast, actually. Um, kind of local city, state. Um, go to this next one here. Audit support. So auditing is a pretty common reason why customers come to t uh, and talk to us, right? They've got a SIM in place. They had an auditor come in if it's HIPAA or if it's uh, you know, high trust or if it's you know, uh, PCI, whatever it might be. Uh, they, they've got the stuff. They check these boxes and then they have an auditor come in and say, okay, great. Now prove to me or show me X, Y, and Z in your system and, and how you store that data. What are you doing in an incident response plan? What are you doing for X, Y, and Z? You know, we'll come in and, and the customer says, I can't do that, right? I don't have time for that. Uh, I need you guys to come in and kind of you know, help out with this process. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of do that as a side effect of running a security operations center. Sometimes you have to help out with auditing, right? It's just part of the business. Uh, so in this scenario, we actually had uh, a, a security policy that was actually really well defined, uh, just not really well followed. Uh, there's a big difference between setting policy and actually enforcing the policy. Uh, and so in this scenario, we had a, a customer that was going through a HIPAA audit. Uh, auditors on site, they, they, the auditor said, hey, I need a, a credential to, to start testing the network. I want to log in. I want to check a few things, kind of try to poke some holes, but not necessarily you know, pen testing. But he just wanted to count and credentials on the network. So we set up a specific domain group on that customer's network at, during the onboarding process. And we said, okay, if, a, if an account matches this security group, we want to identify it as, as something that's more high risk, right? So we're going to investigate the details of that account to access a little bit more so than maybe uh, a janitorial staff uh, login or something similar where the access isn't that high. 
Um, so in that group, though, is where the auditor was added. So we saw that the, the, the auditor's account was added to that network. Uh, and then what happened is we started to see this auditor use this credential to start logging into multiple different locations. They started to try and poke holes in their EMR system. They try to log into different servers. They tried to kind of see what their credentials would get, grant them access to and to see if the customer had any kind of um, you know, management in place to watch that and monitor it. Uh, and so sure enough, we saw that within minutes, we said, okay, this admin account is now accessing 15 different resources on the network. It's kind of unusual what's going on. Uh, so we called the customer, uh, found out that the auditor had added themselves to a number of other security groups. Uh, and then because we had escalated that activity within minutes of it starting to happen, uh, we reached out to the customer. The customer told the auditor and the auditor said, oh, great. You're, you're monitoring all that, good. That's part of what I was testing for was to see if you could track my actual activity. Uh, so because we were able to do that for them and be able to you know, kind of provide that visibility into that auditor's activity, uh, the auditor checked a bunch of boxes off this list and said, all right, we don't even need to go down this road anymore because I know you're watching for it. Uh, so, so sometimes the issue from an organization isn't necessarily uh, an active threat. Sometimes it's just an overhead of, of auditing or overhead of enforcing security policy and, and actually watching that. Uh, and so that's kind of one, of the, one scenario where we've helped where it wasn't necessarily an actual threat on the network, per se. Just a quick question on that. So yeah. was the auditor actually being truthful or was he actually trying to do something he shouldn't have been doing? He, he, was, he was trying to do something that he thought or was hoping the customer had controls in place to protect against because the customer said that they did. Uh, so he was kind of validating or testing the, that, that stated uh, control that was in place for the customer. Uh, so it's something that they, they didn't necessarily expect him to do, but something that was within an expected activity or behavior for an auditor uh, in that scenario. So what was the, because on your bottom bullet there, it says auditor realizing mistake. What mistake did he realize? Adding himself to, to other security groups oh. was the main thing. Is just, you know, his, his access should have only been limited to, to the one, uh, but because it was more of an administrative account, uh, he was able to add himself to other groups. Um, that's that's generally something you, you don't want to have happen as well, right? <laughs> you don't want one person who's not an administrator on the actual network modifying their security group rights. All right, so um, compromised email accounts. Obviously, one of the largest threat vectors that we see in our, in our customer base is phishing. Uh, phishing is a huge source of, of potential issues because your credentials get compromised and credentials can, can give you any access to the network depending on who gets compromised, right? Um, so in this scenario, we had a, uh, a kind of a, 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 a company that does property management, right? They do uh, apartment rentals, they, do, you know, they manage homes and stuff, uh, which also means that this company manages payment, right? They manage a lot of in and out uh, payment to vendors, to customers, and to you know, the people actually leasing the, the apartments and the houses. Uh, so they have a lot of access to funds, they have a lot of access to accounts. Uh, and they also have a lot of employees accessing that data because they have leasing agents at every location that are, you know, they're, they're good at their job, but they're not security professionals, right? They're not people who are trained generally on phishing or what that looks like or what to look out for. Uh, so in this scenario, we had a, a leasing manager uh, credentials uh, harvested by OneDrive. And so what happened was they were sent a OneDrive sharing request, which is a pretty common activity for somebody in this industry. They get shared credentials for things like signed leases or documents. Uh, if they're not using DocuSign, OneDrive is pretty common. Uh, and so for, the, for the, the, the leasing manager, it didn't stand out as an abnormal request. It was like, okay, this makes sense. I'm gonna click here and not even think about it. Uh, so what happened was is, is email be, uh, communication, once they clicked on that, became hijacked, right? So the, the person who had sent that uh, initial phishing attempt realized they had credentials and they were able to log in via OWA to actually modify that person's inbox. And so they can, they can you know, what we see a lot of the times is, is hackers, once they, they harvest those credentials, they immediately log into a, a web console to change the inbox rules so that they can now have communication on behalf of you or whoever that compromised credential is and not have the actual user be aware of it. Right? They don't want the inbox or the reply messages to hit their inbox. They want it to hit a subfolder that the customer is not even looking at. Right? Uh, so it's a way for them to kind of not only access the email, but then use the email without somebody being aware of it. Uh, so we detect that kind of communication. So what happened was to finalize the lease uh, for, for this one specific incident, uh, they had to send back and forth you know, information about, you know, hey, here's the account you have to send it to, here's the amount, here's the check, here's the payable, all, all, all that kind of uh, information. Um, and you can see here, they set up inbox rules and start communicating with the tenant. So what happened is now when the tenant says, okay, where do I send that money? The attacker is the one telling them where to send the money. 
uh, and the person who was that leasing agent has no idea anything's happening. They just think that the customer went quiet. Then maybe they send up a follow-up email, maybe they do something else, but even those follow-up emails aren't gonna get responded to because it's going to that subfolder that they didn't know existed. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting ways that we're seeing uh, phishing being utilized by companies now and by, by attackers uh, to, to gain access uh, that, that the users don't even realize is happening. Um, this, in this scenario, the, the, the leasing manager finally called him and said, hey, are you guys still interested in the apartment? Uh, and the customer was like, uh, yeah, we sent payment info. Like, we're ready to move in. What's going on? Uh, and obviously, no, no, at no point were the two parties actually communicating. Uh, so big threat vector. It's happening more and more. We're starting to see, especially with uh, the prevalence of Office 365 and, and how pretty much every customer we talk to is in Office 365. Uh, it's important to understand or be able to watch for that type of compromise because it, it, there's so many bad things that can happen in that communication um, that, that makes a huge difference. So, Cool. Um, this guy. So we've talked, or I've talked a lot about you know, all the things that we can find and all the problems that, you know, with, with that attackers and hackers trying to get access to your network. But um, there's also potential issues and uh, in, in damages that can be caused in false positives. Uh, that, can, that can sometimes be just as important to, to make sure you have context behind a false positive because uh, we have customers come to us, especially in the beginning of a relationship, right? Uh, a company comes to Arctic Wolf and says, we want to use you guys for stock services, but um, you know, we've been burned in the past or we, we don't really know you guys, you're kind of a newer company. Uh, so in the first you know, three, six, nine months of an engagement with a the customer, there's a certain level of like, okay, like, are you actually doing what we think you're doing or how thorough are you and you know, so on and so forth. Uh, so in this scenario, we actually had a company take it a little bit to the extreme. Uh, they said, great, uh, you know, we, we, we heard your feedback, but we're going to do our own investigation. So what happened was is you know, we, we noticed there was some communication going out uh, to Russia. Right? There was a little bit of egress traffic because one of the things we're doing is, is capturing flow data, watching the ingress, egress traffic. Uh, and we noticed some traffic going to Russia, which for certain organizations might be normal, but for, for some it might be abnormal. Right? This might be something where the customer said, hey, we don't do business in Russia if you see something going out there. It's probably an issue. Uh, so we said, great, yeah, we see some, some traffic going out there. Uh, we didn't find any compromised uh, data, right? We looked in there, we did the analysis, we did all of our investigative work that we would normally do, uh, and we didn't find an actual problem. What we realized was this is probably just a small mail record, right? This is somebody sending a, maybe a CC uh, to somebody with a, a, a domain that's based in Russia, right? So it's a small uh, mail lookup and, pro and possibly just a, an ad content or some sort of DNS query out to Russia. We did our, our work. We did the investigation. We found, hey, everything's fine. You don't need to worry. The customer said, okay, but that's not good. That's not good enough. Any communication out to Russia is a red flag. Now we need to bring in the big guys. So they called out and engaged. They had an IR retainer uh, with Verizon, which uh, if anyone's done that, not cheap, right? They, they charge uh, quite, a, quite a lot of money for, for uh, full IR. Um, after uh, several weeks of investigation, Verizon concluded the exact same thing we did. Yeah, it was an anomalous you know, mail record lookup. No actual breach took place. The customer ended up spending over $50,000. On, on going through that entire process to vet out that the issue that we found that we said was not an issue was in fact not an issue. Um, so, so there's a certain level of, you know, obviously we expect a, a trust relationship to take a little time. You know, we have to kind of figure it out. They have to feel us out. But, um, you know, being able to identify the scope of a breach and, and give assurances that the scope of the breach is, is small uh, and not a large issue can sometimes save companies a lot of money as well. Uh, you don't want to have to engage IR, you know, incident response plans. You don't want to, have to engage uh, cybersecurity policies when you have like uh, insurance against cybersecurity. You don't want to have to go against uh, and do any of that stuff if we can prove that like the issue was not a, a real issue. Right? If we can shut that down early, it can save you guys a lot of money. So that's another issue that we found uh, where you know uh, false positive was a problem. It doesn't happen very often, uh, but it does it does come up. Uh, they confirmed, like I said, initial findings. That's where we caught the issue. Uh, it's right in the beginning, uh, and all said and done, we were good. So, uh, only got a couple more here. Uh, we'll, we'll get through it. But uh, uh, one of the issues we saw with you know customers that have web servers. So we actually have a fair amount of customers who. Uh, you know, host their own applications. We have, obviously we're in California, headquartered here. So a fair amount of SaaS providers who have a, a software application in the cloud that uh, the general public might access, or maybe they have 
uh, a large employee base that, that remotes in and uses something kind of you know, you know, via a web interface. Um, the point being, we have a lot of customers with web servers, right? And web servers are a pretty easy attack vector because they have to be public facing. Uh, and you could put in a WAF, you could put in other controls, but uh, again, if you're not watching those sources, how do you know when they, they stop doing their job, right? Uh, and so what we did is, in this scenario, we had a customer um, with a web server farm on their network that had been running for, for years and years and years, never been breached, no problems. Uh, but when we started taking them on as a customer, kind of in the beginning phase of the onboarding, we noticed that there were some, some interesting DNS queries going to Blizzard. If anyone's familiar with video gaming, Blizzard is a pretty large company. Um, they're also the ones who created World of Warcraft, right? The, the, the pretty common or popular video game. What we actually saw was there were some interesting DNS queries going out there that looked like there was some actual HTTP communication happening. Meaning this wasn't just somebody going to battle.net.com, this was somebody sending and receiving actual HTTP commands to you know, kind of essentially mimic or host their own version of the server. Uh, so what we realized is as we started to dive into it, uh, there was a remote access Trojan installed on one of their machines uh, where an attacker in China had gained access to that server but what's nice, at least for this customer in this scenario, was that the server had been compromised and all they wanted out of it was to just host their own private World of Warcraft server. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, in terms of getting compromised, that's a pretty nice one because there's not like a major financial issue, right? Uh, but it's still a huge red flag because someone in China owns your server. That's a problem. Uh, so we were able to go in there and identify that, hey, you guys are, are running your own uh, World of Warcraft server. Is that on purpose? No? Okay, let's probably get rid of that. Um, so we were able to see that kind of thing too. It, it, that, that's a little bit more common than you'd like to think. Um, we, we see customers with web servers that um, are running services that they had no idea were even on that machine. Uh, and obviously that's, that's a big problem. Part of, part of security is also kind of doing a review, uh, going and sitting down once a quarter and saying, okay, here's all the stuff that we're running in our environment. Uh, does anything stand out as, as not normal, right? Did we put that there? Is it, is it expected? Is it not expected? Uh, so one of the things that we do is, is actually a quarterly review with our customers uh, to make sure that things like this aren't popping up, right? If they've got a service hosted on a website that they aren't aware of, then we want to investigate it further. Because there are times where it may not seem uh, you know, like a, a security threat to us because it may be just a regular business uh, a tool or application, but without that review, without that formal review process, maybe they never realize that it's something that they shouldn't have there. Um, so, so part of security isn't just, you know, is it bad or is it intentionally bad? It's also, you know, reviewing the actual security policy. Yeah, and like I said, luckily all they wanted was the, the web server for, for World of Warcraft. Um, it was on an electric, uh, electronic medical record server, so they could have done a lot worse, um, but uh, in this case, we, we survived. And this one is uh, this one is, is somewhat related, so we'll, we'll talk about Hornblower after this, but um, it's a similar story to this. But uh, a CEO, obviously when somebody gets fished, right, if you get a successful phishing attempt on a network, uh, there are certain users and certain groups in the, in, in the environment that uh, would probably potentially cause more damage than others. Uh, and some of those being people like CEOs or C-level executives where uh, an employee, uh, especially a lower level employee, might not even think <coughs> twice to respond to that email to do whatever it says, right? They don't apply the same critical thinking that they would to an email from a, a coworker, so a, a peer on the same level. Uh, they see something coming from the office of the CEO, they immediately just go into reply mode. Um, so what happened was, uh, was we had a CEO who got fished. Uh, obviously, that's a, a red flag. That's our, our kind of you know, all hands on deck moment. Uh, a CEO getting, at, at a customer getting fished is a problem. Um, the CEO's email immediately BCC'd the entire organization. Obviously, that's the, the first and easiest way to, to compromise a network. Um, one of the em employees obviously clicked the link in the email. What did that do? Malware. Now that machine's compromised, now the CEO's credentials are compromised, and now that employee's credentials are compromised. So now the, uh, the attack on the network is, is starting to spread starting to get a little bit more in depth, getting a little bit more wide, uh, and, and, the, and the, the, the damage, the potential damage that can be caused is going up incrementally uh, or, or, or exponentially. So that employee's website or, or laptop was infected with uh, malware. Uh, one of the things that it infected it with was a keylogger. Uh, obviously now that person's username and password credentials are, stored, are, are stolen, but so is everything they're typing, right? So, which could also mean internal policies, internal workflows, uh, intellectual property, if they're working on something. If this is a, a, an employee that was a lawyer, 
maybe there are certain communications in that, in that, that chain that an attacker might be able to leverage as well. Uh, it's not just about their credentials. Sometimes it's about the actual content of what they're typing. Uh, and when you've got a keylogger on a machine, that's a problem. Um, our little hacker guy here. Uh, so, so obviously, one of the, one of the things that our, our sensors can do, one of the the Arctic Wolf uh, devices that we deploy, has the ability to act as an IPS. Um, once we we identify something like this, an issue where a CEO gets fished, and we start seeing you know clicks to malicious links and things like that, we can go in place and in in our IPS actually block that communication channel. Um, the biggest thing that we want to do is initially limit the scope of the potential damage, right? If you identify something right away, whatever damage has already been done is, is, is done. Let's try and narrow that scope down so that we can stop future damage. Uh, so that's the first thing we did. We blocked that, worked with IT and worked with the employees to identify and do a full postmortem where we said, okay, this is what happened. This is, this is the issues that you were felt with. Uh, these are the user accounts that were compromised. Uh, the CEO that ended up, I think in this scenario, we ended up with like four or five uh, employees that had been compromised. They all clicked the link like right away. Uh, we blocked it all within 20 to 25 minutes uh, from the initial CEO you know, being fished. Uh, but it's, it's still, it, that kind of, that kind of uh, attack can spread very quickly. Uh, and, and without having somebody in place who's actively looking at the data and doing that kind of forensic analysis, it's hard to know what the scope of that breach is, right? Who else was infected? Who else might have issues? And, and what do we do in the future to protect against that? Uh, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff that comes around uh, these types of issues. And that's, again, where we saw that was the, the first click. Um, somebody getting access to the CEO, uh, we saw that, but that, that by the time we realized it was an actual breach was when the second employee clicked on a link, which was within minutes, because the first thing that person did as soon as those credentials were fished, send an email out and try to spread. Um, and then the, I think this is the last one here, uh, uh, personal credentials. So. You know, we've talked about, and I've talked about some of these, you know, idea of like a CEO getting fished on their work laptop while they're sitting in the office. But what happens when they're using their, um, you know, their phone or their email on their phone or their laptop when they go home uh, and they get fished there? You know, what do we do? Um, you know, there's, there's other ways to kind of see that. So we actually have an agent that'll sit on the, end, uh, the endpoint uh, and watch that communication channel as well because a CEO getting fished on his work uh, credentials, huge problem. Uh, but it's just as bad if his personal email gets fished as well, because that person can then use that personal email account to gain access to the business network as well. Like they can send emails, they can do password resets, they can do uh, verification, like they can email IT and say, hey, uh, this is the CEO, I don't have access, my credentials aren't working, I forgot my password, can you send it to my email address here so I can reset it, right? There's a lot of ways that even with a personal email address, an attacker can gain access to a network. Uh, so it's important to have visibility around that as well. Uh, especially for certain employees in an organization where their access might be a little bit heavier, a little bit more important than others. Um, so in this scenario, we had uh, a, an accounts receivable user that was fished on their phone uh, for their iTunes credentials. Uh, and one of the things that we know is that a lot of people, especially not in security, generally use the same passwords, right? The, the, the one for their iTunes is probably the one for their email, for their phone, for their work. I mean, they may change it every six months, but it's gonna change by like one number, right? Um, so the corporate email account was inevitably guessed and brute forced because the person used their iTunes account and was able to log in with the corporate credentials, which were the same password. Uh, it's not hard to figure out, especially if you look at the email address, you can assume that the email address is probably also the domain name. Uh, if it's, you know, username dot last name or first name dot last name, that's probably the same thing for Active Directory. Uh, so they're able to get in and, and actually access the uh, corporate network by using this person's personally fished iTunes account. Uh, so obviously there's some issues there with how did that happen? Should we change password policies, so on and so forth? Um, but they then used a VPN connection and logged into OWA from the same city. So they knew that this person, because they wanted to uh, evade user behavior analysis and, and detection in that sense, they logged into the same, uh, from the same city that the user was in uh, through a VPN connection. So that to, to the corporate network, it seemed reasonable. Like, oh, this person connected in via VPN and they live in Portland, great. Perfect, they're also in Portland. No problems, right? Um, customer, or the criminal immediately logs into OWA, looks through the emails, finds a $100,000 invoice that hadn't been paid yet. This person is unfortunately accounts receivable, so it's not abnormal that they'd have that, have that kind of access in their inbox. Um, the, the criminal detected that, they went through the, the inbox, they read every, every email they could find, uh, and then said, okay, 
great, let's use this trick that we talked about earlier, which is change the forwarding rules on the inbox, communicate with the vendor that owes this company money, give them the routing information and have them send that, that check that was due. And so the customer ended up in this scenario. Um, this, this happened just before they brought in uh, Arctic Wolf and said, hey, we just, we just lost $100,000 because of a phishing attempt that we didn't catch in time. Um, what could we have done about that? Uh, so we walked through and said, hey, this is, this is a, a great use case for a SOC. That's what a SOC should be doing, is watching for that kind of credentialed uh, compromise and, and, and looking for those types of issues. So we were able to come in afterwards and say, hey, this is where we would have caught it. We have proof because we've done it at several of the customers already. Uh, in the future, we can maybe try and save that $100,000. Um, but unfortunately, at certain points, it's, it's, uh, you know, the money's kind of gone. Um, there's, not, there's only so much a bank can do in that scenario to reverse the, the wire transfers and reverse checks and stuff like that. So uh, $100,000 mistake, but hopefully one that they won't have to go through again. Um, cool. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's about really all I've got in terms of canned presentation. Um, the one thing I did want to go over, like I said before, um, we had a, a CEO, similar story to the one we already talked about, um, got fished. This was on a, a Saturday morning. It was like 10 in the morning. Um, they, they didn't realize they got fished. We did. So we said, okay, this is the CEO. Great. We have a, we have a playbook that says if uh, a, a credentialed VIP user in this organization gets fished, call whoever their senior guy was to, to handle this. So we did. Called their senior guy. He didn't answer. Okay, great. Saturday morning, 10 in the morning. Uh, who else do we call? Well, we start going down a call tree. We start trying to get a hold of anyone in that organization that would listen, but it's Saturday morning, everyone's doing whatever it is they're doing, nobody wants to answer the phone. So we finally called and started calling the CEO himself. We said, okay, we just need to get straight to this guy because his credentials are, are, are probably more important than anyone else's. Uh, because again, being able to impersonate a CEO in an inbox is a huge liability. And so we ca started calling this guy, we called him, we finally get a hold of him. His response to us saying that, hey, your credentials have been compromised was, yeah, that's fine. I don't really care. We'll deal with it Monday. We said, okay, <laughs> no. <laughs> so you need to get this fixed right away. Do you have somebody in your organization we can talk to to get it remediated? Uh, because we can't let this go until Monday. By Monday, all of your money is going to be gone. Just period, it will. Uh, and so after multiple phone calls and, you know, the, hey, I'm at my kid's game. I don't want to deal with it right now. He finally found somebody who's willing to take a call from him on our behalf so that we can get his credentials reset and get everything locked down again. Uh, so, so the idea behind that is even when we detect issues, it still requires the staff, still requires employees, it still requires people having a security mindset to treat it with, with severity, treat it like it's a real issue and don't try to blow it off because it's no big deal. Uh, and so that, that comes with a mindset that comes with a security mindset that has to kind of start at the top, has to work its way down. Um, you have to take it seriously and you have to let your security operations center be the authority in that scenario. We have to be able to come in and say, no, this is an issue. You need to get it remediated right now because the potential risk is massive. You could lose a ton of money, you can lose reputation, you can lose name, value, anything. Uh, and so, so for us, it's, it's, it's about making sure that security is something that's at the forefront of our customers, you know, kind of thought process all the way from the CEO down. Uh, and that's something that, again, uh, a lot of the people I think in this room are probably responsible for, uh, is setting that tone, is making sure that security is treated with that kind of high level of, of severity that it should be. Um, we want to avoid situations where the CEO tells us he doesn't care. That's, that's not good. Um, he has learned his lesson since. He is very, very security focused, really good partner of ours now. Um, great, uh, great, great uh, referenceable customer as well, because uh, he, he learned the lessons. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the end of my presentation. Any questions about any of this? Any, anything about Security Operations Center as a service, about uh, some of the issues that we found? I think we only have, what, five minutes left here? Four minutes? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. We uh, not only do we require a lot of credentials and a lot of um, you know, certifications in the industry. I mean, we've got a list a mile long of all the different certifications that our employees carry. Um, but we do full extensive background checks. Uh, we even leverage, you know, like FBI checks for 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 employees for our SOC analysts. Uh, basically, anyone that has access to customer data goes through that process. Um, we uh, became a SOC 2 Type 2 organization, so we're now certified SOC 2. Um, and so even people like myself, I've been in this company for a long time, I'm um, on the engineering team, I don't even have access to customer data. 
Um, we limit that strictly to the people who actually need to have access to that data. So there's small groups in R&D that will have access to it, and then just your security team, uh, and then no one else. Cool. Any other questions? Awesome. Uh, some of these are over the last you know, four or five years, so, so they've been kind of building up over time, but um, the realistic kind of frequency of issues like this is, is about one a month. We're starting to get more because we, we're taking on a ton of customers. Um, we're processing 30 billion events per day now, uh, whereas five years ago we were processing three, million, uh, three billion events. So we're, we're scaling up more rapidly now and we're starting to see issues, but it's about once a month we need to actually get on a, like a war bridge with a customer and, and, and go over a, a breach. Uh, so it's starting to happen more often, yeah. When do you see a service will need to be installed in the, on a custom device? So generally speaking, we require one physical device. It's a hardware sensor. Uh, but the sensor is not just there for log aggregation, but it's also inspecting traffic north and south. It's running an IDS, IPS. Uh, it's doing a lot of other, it's got Suricata, Snort rules. It's got a lot of stuff on that box. Um, so that, that box needs to be deployed on the network somewhere. Uh, and then all of your log sources, your firewalls, Active Directory servers, everything that can generate security log data, point at that device. And then we consume it, bring it all into AWS, which is where our actual SIM technology is sitting. Uh, and then we consume all of that data there. For any of your clouds, things like AWS or Azure, Office 365, Google Private Cloud, uh, Salesforce, Okta, whatever, uh, we have API connectivity out there. So we'll go out and grab it via API, ingest it directly into the SIM. Yeah, uh, part of, we have like 150 plus threat intelligence feeds that we leverage, a lot of open source stuff. We pay for a lot of the high level ones like ET Pro and their aggregate feeds. Uh, and, and there's you know, a good chunk of that is industrial control, SCADA, uh, threat intelligence. So when, when a customer has like a, a section of their network that they've quarantined off and said this is all SCADA, it's a subnet that's not routable normally. You know, we say it's not routable off the internet. Um, we'll monitor for that as well. So if anything does poke out of there and say hey, it starts trying to communicate or phone home somewhere, we're going to detect that uh, communication channel. Um, especially because most of that kind of SCADA industrial control stuff, you can't put an agent out there. You can't put anything on that device because it's enclosed. Uh, so being able to watch that communication channel is really your, your best bet. Uh, pricing is, is kind of a, a unique thing for us as well in the sense that we, we, we basically uh, look at your threat vector uh, or your threat landscape. So we care about how many users you have and these are kind of knowledge workers. Uh, so we d if you have 1,000 employees but 200 of them are out in the field and they don't even have access to Active Directory, then we don't care about those from a cost standpoint. So we just look at users, uh, how many servers are in the, the landscape or in the environment, uh, and then how many of that sensor we'd have to deploy. Uh, and the sensors are, are a small component of the, the price or kind of a, a cheap small one U box. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, and it's static, it doesn't change from month to month, it's subscription rate. Uh, so it's gonna be the, the same amount every, every month, it doesn't go up. The biggest thing is it's not based on log volume or events per second or anything like that that might fluctuate. Uh, we just look at users and servers essentially. Cool, anything else? Thank you. Awesome, yeah.